Hey, this is Chris Keithley, and you're listening to the Parkour Coach Companion Podcast. Who remembers this one? Well done to Tom Taylor for last episode. You got it right. It was out of time. New Jabez, Kodama. Same again this time. If you recognize this beat from a classic parkour video, make sure you tell me and I'll mention you in my next podcast. Parkour Coach Companion, connecting coaches, connecting practitioners, asking questions, creating conversations. This is episode 21 with Olive. Hello, Olive. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I know you've got a busy timetable. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a bit about what you've been doing today and what your kind of like schedule is over the week as a yoga instructor. Mm, I mean, so it's <laughs> my workload has reduced by... I don't know, say 50% in terms of like how many classes I now teach a week just because studios aren't open. Mm. It's a lot harder to do classes online. Um, but today in particular, I've just had like quite a crazily busy day. Um, <laughs> I'm currently working on a project with um, Vice where we're doing like a 30 day splits challenge. So we're seeing if this guy, Tom, can get into the splits in 30 days. So I've like mm. created a program for him, which is obviously not just based on like, here's a yoga flow, do it three times a week and you'll do it. No, it's more like <laughs> programming, like mobility and strength and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so we had a catch up this morning. It's like the second week and see how he's getting on, which is cool. Um, and then I've been trying to spend a little bit more time writing this article, which is how I guess we got in touch. Like he messaged me about like natural movement. So I had an overwhelming like response from people on my stories yesterday. I basically said, what do you think looks more natural or what is more natural to you? Me doing a squat with a barbell or me doing this like ridiculous like yoga pose? <laughs> I was just like, I was just curious to see what people thought because I've heard like the term natural movement floating around in the fitness industry for quite a while. Um, and I just wanted to hear what people's perceptions were. Um, so from all of their responses and from my own thoughts, I've like, I wanted to put it into like a concise article um, and just sort of get all like my mind chatter out my head. Um, so I was working on that, which was pretty fun. And then I had uh, one of my, my best friends come over and we just did like a little mini shoot at home. She's um, a photographer and she's like trying to like build up her portfolio a little bit. Um, so yeah, we just did a little shoot at home. Now on the podcast with you and then I'm teaching at seven um, online. So yeah, you picked me at a really busy day, which is quite yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was super chuffed. Like I've messaged you very late last night. I just thought, yeah. right. You've talked about weight training and yoga and kind of the differences mm. and maybe similarities and the compatibilities between them. And that is exactly what I've just talked about with Louise in the last one. That's so, so crazy. I was like, <laughs> let's see. And you did it. And I was like, yes, let's go. Um, I love it. Just like the divine timing of it all. You're yeah. like, yes, I love it when shit like lines up like this. Yeah, yeah it was awesome. So you're surviving, so, you're surviving then. You're surviving uh, and thriving, yeah. did you say? Yeah. Like... Don't get me wrong, it's been getting pretty boring, like having the same kind of structure every day yeah. and, you know, only just being able to go outside and walk about. It's too cold to train outside, so it's like you're limited to indoors. Mm. So it's getting boring in that respect, but like, like for my business, things are going in a really positive, interesting direction right now. So I'm really enjoying that and just trying to hone in on my own kind of projects that have been on like the back burner um so yeah in that respect it's going well but yeah i'm surviving i'm okay good <laughs> good I'm yeah complaining <laughs> well it's it's tough for coaches at the moment i mean i'm mm. on furlough and kind of putting all my effort and energy into this podcast just because i want to learn you know from other people i want to learn from parkour coaches people mm. like yourself from outside the discipline and all sorts of different people and just how 
you know, how do we learn? How do we help people learn that sort of thing? And yeah. just kind of ticking over like that. But um, yeah, um, that's great that you're involved with Vice. I'll be interested to watch that. And yeah, um, yeah on your on your on your point about the um, the post that you made, mm -hmm. um, it was interesting to see the the, the answers to that. Actually, um, I think people's perception of what is natural is is mm. really interesting. So, could you tell me a bit about your thoughts? The, your thoughts there with yoga practice and strength and weight training and how those things can they you know can they uh, can they find harmony with each other? Yeah, so I think like plain and simple answer definitely i think everyone who does yoga can benefit from doing more strength training everyone who does strength training can benefit from doing more yoga because there's a lot to be said like there are so many similarities between the two disciplines like not only okay apart from the physical side like mentally they can be very very similar in terms of the discipline and the whole like idea of non-attachment and not doing it for like ego and all this kind of stuff um so for me like personally I've been doing yoga about seven years and throughout those seven years I've like dipped in and out of doing strength training kind of had it there but never had a real like consistent practice until about um I'd say last June time I actually started dedicating like um my time to doing two sessions a week and honestly I've seen such a massive change in terms of strength and stability when it comes to me now doing like certain yoga poses I have more stability when I do like arm balances or handstands and just like more general awareness of how to actually activate my muscles like it's super easy as someone who's like naturally quite flexible yoga comes very easy and quote unquote naturally to me <laughs> I can get into poses with like no real strain on my muscles or on my joints. Doesn't mean it's good though, because I'm obviously not engaging the right areas or doing it safely. But my strength training has taught me how to like cultivate that control and cultivate that awareness that my yoga practice didn't have. And of course, like my strength training, it has become more natural to me through my body, like adapting to it through like progressive overload and repetition. So I think people's perception of what natural movement is can take so many different tangents and it's such a nuanced topic. <laughs> That's why I was like, I need to write this article and get it down because yeah. there's so many avenues you can like approach. So I guess like what I want to ask you is what do you define natural movement as or what's your understanding of it? Mm. Oh, you're asking me? You're flipping it over yeah. on me? Okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> that's very kind. Yeah, um, for me, anything that exists is intrinsically natural. Like, I think that there's this kind of, I don't know, like, I kind of, in my head when I hear natural, I kind of zoom right out and see the earth and I see, like, mm. everything going on it. I see us and nature and science and technology and everything. But it's like, it's all it's all part of the same thing. Like it is, it's all working together and I don't really see any difference in like that's unnatural, that is natural because nothing is like outside of the earth that we inhabit, if that makes sense. Like it's all, you know, it's part of the same thing. So for me, um, that's my kind of like first thought. In terms of natural movement, hmm, it's a good question. I think, I think that hum maybe you could say that humans have like a huge proclivity for like moving naturally. Like as children, mm. we do move without thinking about movement too much. We, we move and we shuffle around on the floor, we crawl. We have a, you know, we, we have a, a, an amazing competence to learn how to, to move and how to stand and how to walk, how to run and, and then further on do, do incredible activities. So I, I'd, I'd really struggle to like, pinpoint one movement and say that's unnatural but strangely yeah. enough some of the like freakier movement I'd be like whoa that's 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 kind of unnatural that looks weird <laughs> but then yeah. only because it's different it doesn't actually mean unnatural it just means it's mm. it's interesting so yeah I, I would never put a limit on saying something that's on, on movement as you know unnatural really but it's an interesting question because people's perception like you said is so mm. you know Mm. so different and 
I got a lot of like responses and comments being like, yeah, in day to day life, I'd find myself doing more like squatting. I wouldn't feel the need to like pull my foot behind my head, which again, like I totally get that can be your definition of natural. And like you were saying, as a kid, you very comfortably sit in a squat. As we get older, we've lost that ability to do so. But again, the important thing to remember is that whatever load we put on the body, the central nervous system doesn't really differentiate between like a barbell or a kettlebell or a resistance band or a log. It's like, it's our subjective value that we've assigned to it. I've taken this like directly from one of Callum's posts because we were talking about it yesterday, but that's essentially what we're doing. Like the body doesn't really tell the difference between the things. So Mm. I could do a squat with (laughs) a barbell or I could do it with a log, but it's going to have the same load on my tissues and my body will respond accordingly to that. So I find it really bizarre when people say that, body weight movement is more natural than movement that has like an external apparatus like to me that just that argument is really like flawed for a bunch of different ways because as you rightly said everything exists and it's come from somewhere humans are part of nature and what we have created is also nature you know so yeah that's another argument to have (laughs) Mm. um yeah, so my head's been like going around and around with all these different like avenues of understanding as well. And also the fact that you can over time make a movement more natural to your body. So for me, because I trained that very specific yoga move where it's called King Dancer. So if you guys wanted to Google it quickly, it's basically where like both of my hands are on my foot and my foot is being like pulled behind my head. So my spine (laughs) is in like, oh my God, a load of extension. There's a lot of like biomechanics going on. It doesn't look natural, but my body has adapted in order to make it feel more natural as in like the control. Similarly, if I was to train to get like, say a hundred kilos on like a back squat, my body will like learn to adapt to that load over time so that it becomes more natural. So in my head, what I kind of came to the conclusion as yesterday was <laughs> everything is natural, everything is unnatural. It's your approach as an individual towards that and how present you are with your body at that time to that movement, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, kind, of, yeah. kind of linking back with my conversation with Louise, mm. what do you think about um, these ideas in terms of longevity? So... I think we had a slight um, disagreement because in my head, I think that strength training generally can help with things like longevity. But he said he's not, he's more on like the yoga side and doing a lot of like stretching and flexibility work and things like this and kind of, he doesn't really do much weight training, I don't don't think. I'm sorry, Louise, if I got that wrong. Um, (laughs) But what's, yeah, what's your opinion? Like, I mean... uh, Mm. It's, it's a difficult one, but what's your opinion on, on longevity and how, yeah. how can we keep moving for a long time? Which, which of these approaches, or both, you know, which, or neither, mm. you know, which, which one do you think will promote longevity or help with longevity? I think, again, going back to my point earlier, I think a mixture of the two is the best way to have a balance in your body where one obviously can promote this idea of flexibility, the other can promote strength. And the combination of the two will create mobility. So what I've noticed in my students who are very like, who are very good at their yoga practice, the easiest way for me to describe them is like they're very noodly, like little noodles, like there's not real strength behind them. Now, when someone is insanely flexible, but they have no control over their muscles and no real stabilization over their joints, they're just going to overstretch and overstretch and overstretch. And eventually they're just going to create irritation in their tendons and they can like tear. So the amount of yogis, there's actually a fucking um, (laughs) injury coined yoga butt. And it's because, and it's through this like over mobilization and overstretching of the hamstrings. So your attachment point to your sit bones, it just tears and rehabbing that can take like six months to a year. Mm. Um, 
And that's because they're very stretched out muscles, but very, very weak. So I think too much yoga is definitely not going to promote longevity. longevity. <laughs> mm. Whereas again, like with strength, uh, like strength training, whilst it can be good, if you do it like, and you're not present or you're not mindful with what mm. you're doing, you can mm. really fuck yourself up. If yeah. you have poor like mechanics or poor mobility and you do a squat and your knee caves in, my God, your lower back is going to feel like, like shit. shit. Mm. Same, Same with, with a deadlift. If you like, on the way back down to the ground, if you flex into your lumbar spine, again, that's going to be so shit for your body. Mm. Um, but I think strength training, at least for me, has allowed me to stabilize my joints more and actually know how to activate my muscles properly, which then is like, it's the crossover between the two. Mm. So I think a mixture of both can promote longevity, like longevity. My God, I can't say that word today. Anyway. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you've got to be mindful with all your movement because when I first started yoga, I was like, yeah, I just want to get into these like super cool shapes, look like a human fucking pretzel. <laughs> and oh my God, it was awful. My body hated it. Mm. It looked cool on like the external, but inside like everything was crying. And I had a very similar approach at the beginning to my um, strength training. I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to go super heavy on the squats like, and deadlifts. Yeah just for the sake of like numbers and reps and ego and again Mm. my body hated it Mm -hmm. but i think you know the awareness comes with time and practice over however long it is (laughs) yeah Yeah. for sure for sure Mm. and something that i was thinking about um after talking with louise which i don't know whether you agree with or not is that i find it really interesting that parkour and yoga there seems to be a bit of a a sort of similarity in gender ratios in some way mm. because a lot of it seems to me it seems like a lot of guys are starting to get more into yoga and a lot of girls are starting to get more into parkour so i was wondering do you think there's there's any uh do you think there's any, any evidence of that do you think that's i mean yeah i think um obviously like the parkour world for me is like very very new but from what like Callum's shown and just from like what I've seen online it seems to be like this uptake in um especially like I guess like younger girls getting more into parkour which is so so sick and like Mm -hmm. Lynn's one of my close friends so I've like seen her in the world like you know how she's been in the parkour world over the past few years Mm -hmm. um but yeah I definitely think there's like I don't know just maybe as like a society as a whole we're starting to like break down these really harmful gender stereotypes of what women and what men should do in terms Mm. of movement and sport as in what's masculine and what's feminine Mm -hmm. but that that's been ingrained in us since we were kids at school you know like when we did PE boys would always go do football girls would do like dance or netball so already that stereotype has been ingrained and throughout our adult life there's this unconscious bias over what you should do Mm. so Mm. Even in my yoga classes, I'd say it's more like an 85-15% split between women and men. But it is getting like, you know, more men are starting to realize that it's not just something that middle-aged women (laughs) do and that there's so many benefits for everyone. Mm. And especially, um, at least here in Brighton, there are quite a few like male teachers, which I definitely think helps when it comes to like... Mm. um exposure to the masses of like actually showing that and feeling represented by what you see um but then yeah I've had like it's been really nice to see more guys come to my class because I can see the value that it brings to them um but yeah I think you're right there is like this shift starting to slowly happen but also interestingly like it's not spoken about that much the practice of yoga was originally designed for 14 year old Indian boys is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And now somewhere along the way in the West, it became this really like luxurious kind of thing where only middle to upper class white people could do it. <laughs> and majority of them were like stay at home mums. And we're like, how have we come so far away from what it is or what it was made for or who it was made for or whatever you want to talk about? Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, stra- it's so strange, isn't it? How, how cultures mix and ideas change and and move around the world Mm -hmm. and kind of 
in some good ways and some like strange ways that are not so great and it's super interesting um but you yeah. yourself do i've seen a few clips of you doing some parkour stuff so <laughs> I, I i assume you kind of train a bit um i wanted to ask you actually about your the arm jump that you did um <laughs> which you put on instagram and yeah it's something that i have kind of been like break kind of breaking jumps and feeling mm -hmm. safe within a movement and being able to commit to movement is something I've been kind of thinking more about and writing about recently. So can you try and explain your experience to the listeners about how you went from, you know, sitting in your house and then thinking, right, I'm going to try and jump to this wall um, and how you, how you yeah. kind of got there? Like what was going through your mind and stuff? Um, yeah, so this is something why I've been so drawn to parkour recently like the mental and the physical challenge is just something that I don't gain from my strength training and from my yoga practice anymore so obviously like the practice of parkour is very like different to any other movement I kind of do it's more dynamic and quick and my muscles are still like trying to respond to that but even my mentality is so different so I did um, a smaller arm jump on the same wall but to another wall and I sort of broke that and I was like, okay, cool. But this one just felt way more sketchy because it was further away. It was to a surface that I hadn't yet like placed my hands on. So I didn't know what it felt like. And it just felt huge. <laughs> so I think I um, spent about I recorded myself because I wanted to see like what was going through my mind, what was going through like my body language and everything as I was trying to, like you say, like break this jump. So I was looking at it for ages and I was sort of standing on the edge and just sort of like looking backwards and forwards, like checking the distance. One of the first things I did was go on the floor and jump from the same distance just to see if I could actually make it because there's no point in trying it if I just couldn't. I was like, OK, cool, I can do this. I can make this gap. It's fine. And then I was like, okay, my next fear that came into my head was, what if you jump to the wall, don't make it, you're now going to have to take impact from a drop. I was like, okay, fine, get back on the wall, jump the same distance, but jump down to the ground to see what it would feel like to take that impact. Mm -hmm. So I did that a couple of times. I was like, okay, cool, comfortable with that, mental challenge, over. The next thing I was then like was, hmm, I don't know what this surface actually feels like. So I climbed up, climbed around, went to the surface, played around with it, felt what it felt like, and then did like a negative climb down just to be like, okay, if I do grip it, am I gonna ping off or not? And I was like, no, okay, it's all cool. Took a little drop as well. So I slowly started to break down all the possibilities of like stuff going wrong mm. that I could think of in my head and try to like mitigate them or try to like make them feel less of a big deal. And then it was a case of like, okay, now let's see when you feel safe to move. So I was like standing on the edge, like looking and I can recognize like two um, voices. This sounds so insane. Two voices in my head when I do it. One is like the brain, one is the heart. <laughs> the heart is like, yeah, let's fucking go. Let's do this. You got this. <laughs> and the brain is like, nah, chill out. We're not ready just yet. Hang mm. on. We need to breathe. We need to calm down. Mm. So I would like walk down the wall, walk back up just to change like what I was looking at, maybe have a little bounce on the wall just to like, again, get the spring in my step, look at it again. And my heart, my brain still went at the same level, did the same thing, walked away, got myself out of the situation, breathed a little bit. And I think I did that maybe five or six times. And eventually I was like, everything felt like it was ready to go. Like my brain and my heart <laughs> were at the same kind of like, great um and then eventually I did it and I was like holy shit and then I kind of managed like a really like scrappy attempt at a climb up and then the negative and I was like oh my god sick and then yeah and then I did it like three four more times just to make sure it wasn't like dumb luck <laughs> but it was really really fascinating to see how my brain and how my heart was talking to one another because I just haven't had that experience I don't think ever so mm. yeah <laughs> nice nice yeah. something so uh so interesting in part of the kind of parkour process of of overcoming something new 
Did you feel, and if you can ca kind of cast your mind back, when you actually jumped, did you mm -hmm. feel a sort of equal sense of like um, complete acceptance and kind of fuck it, kind <laughs> of like this sort of not? It's hard to explain. It's kind of like a. Yeah. It's kind of like a letting go of of um worry of the consequence it's kind of like a it's almost like a controlled recklessness because mm. I, I feel this sometimes when i do something new that's scaring me in the moment you know pretty much within the second whether you've done it or not so there's, there's a yeah. kind of acceptance but then at the same time there's a sort of like uh like recklessness maybe i need to find a better word for yeah. it but I, I wonder whether you can relate with that no, no, I do, I do get it. It's sort of like that moment that you feel your feet leaving the wall. It's like, well, fuck it, I'm doing it now. I may as well like accept <laughs> the fact and accept the outcome that's happening. Yeah. And obviously it's like such a split moment in time that that happens. But yeah, looking back, I can definitely see how those two like interlink with one another. That's so interesting. Yeah, because I guess like when you're so prepared and you've gone through the whole mental process of breaking it down, thinking about the outcomes. The only thing that is really left is just like, well, fuck it, I may as well just give it a go. Otherwise I'll never know. <laughs> so, and, it, yeah. and it's strange that, you know, we, I think parkour people tend to hold quite tightly onto this idea that parkour isn't reckless. And I, mm. I, I agree, but then it, you have to kind of look a bit deeper into these things because I think there is this like slight feeling of, well, come on, let's just give this a go sort of thing. And yeah, it, it yeah. is in there somewhere and it kind of, I, I just, I've kind of tried to be a bit more honest with myself about like when I do break a jump in that that kind mm. of is there a bit. I guess obviously the problem is when, when that gets too, too uh, extreme when people just, you know, sending it or whatever and they're not, yeah. they're just, they're not even thinking properly. So. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's like, having the awareness of yourself and your practice and your current strengths and weaknesses and not just like sending it for the sake of it and not just being like, oh, fuck it. And just being like you said, totally reckless with your movement um, and having no real like consideration for, I guess, the outcomes. But then on the other end of the scale, you also don't want that to then stifle your growth. You don't want it to like completely hold you back. So it's such an interesting mind game of figuring out that like real fine balance between the two and then yeah taking it from there which I guess is only a skill that you can really start to develop like the longer you've really been in a practice for mm -hmm. yeah mm. absolutely and I, I was going to ask you I think you sort of covered it before so I think I know the answer but do you <laughs> ever feel any fear when you um, do yoga I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Because, again, the movement is can be at least very, very static and controlled. I think I would only feel fear if I felt like, I don't know, a really awful twinge in like my knee or my back or like some kind of like muscular pain signal where I'm like... <gasps> oh god what have I done have I taken it too far or whatever but um I think especially now not really I do like maybe when it comes to me doing no because I don't even feel it there I was just thinking like when I do an arm balance or like an inversion when I was falling if I felt fear but I don't because like I've fallen so many times that it's just like part of the process like it's just like natural to me so I guess, yeah, the fear would be like just feeling a horrible kind of reaction from my body if I did a pose, weirdly, um, which is quite, obviously quite nice. <laughs> it's not like there's too much holding me back until I get into a pose, for example. Um, which kind of got me thinking about your previous question, which you asked about longevity in terms of yoga and weight training. Just to quickly touch back on that. Go for it. So, majority of yoga poses involve like passive stretches so passive being like 
you would use an external force to bring you deeper past your current range or available range of motion to get into a pose. So like a standing forward fold, you could grab your like shins and pull yourself deeper into it. Whilst that's not necessarily like a problem um, for the vast majority of people, I think passive stretching definitely has its place in movement. It shouldn't be people's only form of stretching. People need to include more dynamic, more active forms of stretching to gain the most benefits from it. Otherwise, because there's been loads of research done recently, whereas um, the long term effects of passive stretching go very, very quickly within like 20 minutes. <laughs> I don't I mean, don't quote me on this, but it was like something ridiculous like that. Like the effects of it, the long term effects just really don't exist. And obviously, when you hear this coming from a yoga teacher, I feel like such a hypocrite because I'm like, yeah, come to my class and we'll explore passive stretches. <laughs> but I don't know. I've come to peace with the fact that I don't just teach passive stretches. I mix in a bunch of other stuff. I do mobility. I do active work. But I also have the space for passive stretches because I do think it can be good. If, even if it doesn't have like a physiological response to the individual's muscles, it's like the state of being in a pose for, say, six breaths is calming on the nervous system, which can be beneficial for people who are, who are like, stressed or anxious or whatever. So, yeah, it's got its place. <laughs> but, yeah, going back to the point, I think, for longevity for your yoga practice, you need to have a mixture of different forms of stretching and mobility, for sure. Talking about breathing um, mm -hmm. is something that I don't do enough of, actually. I think breathing is super cool. And I think that the pranayama and yeah, yeah, yeah. neti pot, mm -hmm. is that pronounced right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I saw those on your feed and had a quick look at them because I thought they were kind of interesting. I've tried the, I actually tried the pranayama like years ago. I remember doing it like... Um, just on like train journeys, just going like back and forth, back and forth sort oh, of thing. Oh, sick. Um, sick. I don't think I... What, what do you think are the main... If someone just asked you straight up, like, what are the main benefits? Why should I do this? Um, could you go through the pranayama and the neti pox? I think they are... They just... I mean, they're just not really done much. That, mm. that in general, populace. Like, people just don't really do stuff with their breathing. So, could yeah. you explain? Yeah, so... These are like some of the other main components of the yogic practice or like even yogic lifestyle that just unfortunately aren't shared or spoken about as much because it's not as sexy to do in like the <laughs> in the most basic sense. Like pranayama um, is all the breath work that you do in yoga and the purpose to doing it and having a whole practice dedicated to pranayama is to understand your inhale the hold at the top of your inhale, the exhale, and then the hold at the bottom of your exhale. So in theory, all those four components should make up part of one round of breathing. Mm. But through our evolution, we've kind of gone through a state of disevolution where we've kind of fucked up our breathing patterns and like our nasal cycle and our sinuses and the structure of our face because our brain has grown it's just meant that everything is a little bit more squashed. So our breathing has kind of been fucked through evolution. This is a really interesting book you should read by a guy called James Nestor, all about the breath, um, where he outlines like human history and stuff like this. Cool. So the purpose of pranayama is to bring conscious awareness to our breathing, because we all obviously breathe throughout our day, but unconsciously. And as soon as you tell someone to notice their breath, there's like a panic response. It's like, oh my god, what the hell, like, oh, the inhale, it feels way too short, it feels way too panicky, and then when you tell someone to breathe in a yoga class, again, stress, panic, because it's like, I've never been told to breathe, I've never really focused in on it, and the idea with pranayama is that you practice this to get good at the four aspects of the breathing, so that when you do, say, in your practice, accidentally hold your breath, you can still calmly bring yourself back to a normal breathing pattern and obviously like take that out into your external life. Um, so it's just trying to teach us to be more conscious with our breath so that whenever we are unconscious, we still maintain good practice. Um, 
So that's kind of the main component of pranayama. And there are so many different techniques out there which can train like one or two of the aspects of the breath. So what you were doing is alternate nostril breathing or mm-hmm. like shodhana. And it's again, like looking at the inhale and the nasal cycle and oh, the nasal cycle. Oh my God, it's so interesting. Yeah. So every 30 minutes to two hours, it's either going to be easier to breathe through your left nostril or through your right nostril. So you can check now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So different. mine's left side right now. Me too. Me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So that will change. And again, say so the next 30 to two hours time, and it will be more right nostril dominant. Now, the thing with that, if you want to take it even further, we know that breathing stimulates the hemispheres in the brain. So right nostril breathing, when it's clearer through that side, will stimulate the left hemisphere. And then the left nostril breathing will stimulate the right hemisphere of the brain. Mm. Yeah. And then you can take it even further. So again, if you're breathing more through the left nostril and it's going to the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere is responsible for more creativity. So that's why we could have more creative spouts during our day. The right nostril is linked to the left hemisphere, so more like logic. That's why we could have more logic throughout the day. Do you know what I mean? So you can sort of like start to understand these waves and patterns of how the breath is so interlinked and interwoven into our every fiber of our being. Mm. Um, so that's why there's so much importance given to the practice of pranayama, and which is why when in a class, at least I know I do, and I know a bunch of other teachers, I spend the first... 10 minutes of class focusing on the breath. I always guide the breath throughout the movement and we finish with like breath work as well. Nice. Because, yeah, and you think about it, like the breath is so fundamental to our entire existence. It's the first thing that happened when we came out of the womb and it's the last thing to happen before we die. So why don't we give it the attention like it deserves? (laughs) Amen, amen, yeah. That's that's a really Mm. good point, really good point. Yeah, big time. And then going into the neti pot stuff. So neti pot is kind of part of um, the kriyas. Kriyas are like cleansing techniques in yoga. So it can be everything from like tongue scraping to stuff that you do with your abdominals where you make them like wave side to side. I don't know if you've seen any of my videos of me doing that. It's really crazy. It's super cool. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And... um, So neti pot is again to help clear the nasal passageways. Mm. So you have like a pot of like um, lukewarm water with a little bit of salt. You pour it in through one nostril and then it comes streaming out the other side. And it's a little bit gross, but it helps so much. Like it's helped me so much when I've had like um, hay fever and everything and everything just felt super blocked up. And it's just like to breathe easy. It just feels really good. So they say you should do it before your pranayama practice just so you can get the best out of it but yeah so i guess also the main um takeaway we can have from focusing in on our breath is that a lot of them it depends on the type of breath work but the majority of them at least like work to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system so the one more responsible for like rest and recover and just like bringing it into context in our current like weird old state of life i think everyone's like baseline stress levels are a lot higher than normal (laughs) um more cortisol going around and that's obviously had weird like repercussions um Mm. to like our physical health our mental health so by just taking time out of your day like maximum it can be 10 minutes to just sit and breathe with yourself practice a technique starts to slow down your nervous system, allowing you to enter more into the parasympathetic state. So your body's allowed this time to rest and recover, elevations of heart rate decrease, blood pressure decreases, but also just like general stress, you always come out of it feeling so much more grounded. Mm. And I'm not just saying that because it's a phrase that yoga teachers always say, I'm saying it like you genuinely do, you feel so much more present and aware to your body. Um, and it's so important to check in, I think, especially these days when, I don't know about you, but my brain feels like everywhere. <laughs> so it's a sense of like coming home more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and again, going back to this book by James Nestor, so many of our current modern day and Western like diseases have been brought on through like breathing abnormalities. 
I can't remember them off the top of my head, but again, you could say like anxiety is linked to poor breathing mechanics for sure. Because if you're not able to take full inhalations and full exhalations, you're always in this kind of half inhaled state where you're stimulating your um, sympathetic nervous system. So fear, like fight or flight. Um, obviously that's again, very dependent on the individual, but that can be a factor as well. And it's just something that we don't really talk about. <laughs> nice. Yeah. If you're listening guys, breathe, <laughs> breathe as Wim Hof says, just breathe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could, I could ask you a lot more about Wim Hof as well, but we'll, we, we could be here for a while. So, um, <laughs> we'll try and pull it back into sort of coaching because that is hopefully mm. the goal with this podcast. So what is your, what's your general view on two things? What's your view on parkour coaches, if you've had experience with parkour coaches and that mm-hmm. kind of, and I, I, I guess the parkour community as a whole, and, and how, what is your view on, on yoga teachers, instru- you wouldn't call them coaches, mm-hmm. but in, instructors, um, and yeah. the world of yoga in instructing? Um, yeah, what's your view on those mm-hmm. things? So I guess, like, I'm really fortunate when it comes to the parkour coaching because Callum's been the one who's shown me the majority of stuff. (laughs) And he's a very level-headed, very sensible, but also very unpatronising coach, which I really value. Like, Mm. I've had people in the past who are very, very patronising when it comes to me, like, learning a new movement, and I'm like... (laughs) I don't appreciate this. I really, really don't. What do they say? How do they say it? I don't know. It was with different movements. It was um, like with climbing and with like strength training. It was like, mm, you shouldn't do that because your shoulders aren't like strong enough. And just kind of like putting me down for something that I haven't really had a chance to work on yet. And that's something that's really new. Or just like when it comes to me climbing and doing a climb and I'm like, no, it's way too scary. I don't like it. And then be like, why? This is nothing. Do you know what I mean? Really not trying to understand me or put themselves in my shoes. Um, Whereas Callum, because he's had such a wealth of experience teaching a bunch of different people and obviously like his, however many years it is, like training, he's been able to understand loads of different situations and scenarios and also understand that everyone is starting from their own place. It's everyone's own very personal journey. Um, so just to give an example, the other day we went out with um, some of the guys, Leon and Jordi and Jay, and we were looking at descents. <laughs> Callum was like, "Do you wanna? Do you wanna like give these like um, descents like a little bit of a go? We can take it super slow, stop at any point, whatever feels uncomfortable." I'm not afraid of heights because, like I said, I climb, so it's, like, not too bad. And I've done, like, a little bit of, like, buildering. Um, so we, like, came over the railing, just walked along, like, the beam. And, and then we got to one of, like, the descent, descent spots, quote, unquote. And he was like, okay, right, here's one way you can do it. Slowly come down. I'll come off to the side. And I looked at it and I was, like, again, working it out of my head, feeling the brain, the heart sort of relationship. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool, I can do this. And the whole time he was like, Olive, like, if you don't feel safe, obviously, like, don't don't push it just for the sake of it. It doesn't matter if you walk away today having not achieved that. You've achieved so much else in the meantime. Um, and then I did it, and my feet, like, hovered maybe, like, an inch or so off the rail, and I was like, oh, fuck. But, then, <laughs> like, they came down, and it was fine, and, yeah, it felt really smooth. Nice. And then we continued again at my own pace when I felt ready, And it was just like, I really, really appreciated that because I had never felt so listened to (laughs) from a coach before. (laughs) So I was like, yeah. So that was really, really nice um, in that respect. So that's been my um, experience with Callum. And then Jay has been really, Jay was really, really fun to work with as well. He was just like, oh, Olive, he was just getting so excited. He's like, yeah, you could do this. We can try this. You've got like this down. So let's take it to the next level. I was like, fuck yeah. So it was also really fun to work with like Jay as well in that respect. Like we've been meaning to train together for like years, but it's obviously just like only happened very recently. Mm -hmm. Um, But even like going back to Callum, I was really like worried of like the whole power dynamic kind of thing um just with him like being my boyfriend it was a little bit like oh god how is this now gonna 
translate into him being a coach and mm. not that I would ever say he's got the whole like guru mentality or I'm on a higher pedestal than you kind of mentality but it was like oh I wonder how this is now going to switch from us being like equal to now you telling me what to do mm. and I and notoriously I... don't like being told what to do at all That's I'm very stubborn when what it comes to <laughs> <laughs> um, but he handled it really well he clearly knows what I'm like as a person so that was quite interesting <laughs> um and then when it comes to yoga teachers, oh my gosh, I really, I, I struggle to be told what to do when it comes to yoga. I really, really struggle to go to another teacher's class. Um, and I've spoken like quite in depth about this with my friend Grace, who's a teacher up in Liverpool. And I think it's a combination of various factors. Again, I don't like being told what to do. When I'm in the class, I'm too preoccupied about being like, hmm I wouldn't cue it like that hmm I wouldn't like give the instructions like that that. again it's highlighting my insecurities or um my you know projections or whatever um and also I'm like oh that's a really cool idea I need to remember how to do that so I can take it away you know and make it like my own um so that's like one reason but also I've had yoga teachers in the past who are very very like passive aggressive towards me and very condescending which is ironic. You wouldn't think that would happen in a very loving, supportive community. There are a, there are a lot of snakes in the yoga industry. I will say that right interesting. now. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, so, yeah, I've had very passive aggressive teachers. Like I remember this one teacher who was, I'd, I think she's in her like mid forties. Very very dogmatic. Very very traditional in her approach to teaching doesn't really like to listen to the new like ideas which help um students and practitioners grow and she just kept calling out my name in class and giving me like very verbal direct cues being like olive put your hips down lower or olive don't lift that leg as high and i was like jesus fucking christ that makes me feel like i have a spotlight on me and that's not what i want when i go to a class of like 30 people so that made me feel (laughs) so uncomfortable um especially when it is such a personal practice and she doesn't know what feels good for me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and then I've obviously had and found some teachers that I really do get along with. Um, majority of them are like my friends and I respect the strong practice that they have. I think that's also my problem. The teacher has to have like a relatively strong practice in order for them to, in order for me to feel like they will safely guide me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's like, I'm not going to start taking advice from someone who can't do a handstand if they're teaching a handstand class. I'm like, no, that's missing the mark entirely. But I also think because, and not, I'm not trying to like inflate my own ego, but because I have a very strong and experienced practice, it's going to take a very advanced class for me to feel like I'm gaining a lot from it. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, um, I couldn't get on with another teacher who does a very similar style of practice to me because of all that external noise and distraction going on of like, oh, I want to steal this idea. Oh, I wouldn't do it like that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Whereas I would find more value from a style that I don't do. So yin yoga, I've never really done it. When I have, I find it really interesting. I can actually shut off. Similarly with um, yoga nidra, which is like a very... um, which is like an extended form of like uh, guided meditation. You're generally lying down. It's beautiful. <laughs> or even like Kundalini yoga, which I haven't explored yet and I want to. Or rocket yoga. Like there's so many forms that I haven't explored. And I think I would get on more with those teachers because I don't know what to expect. So, yeah, I answer that in a very long-winded way, but hopefully I made my point clear. <laughs> no, it made sense. I think it's... I like... Uh, I can definitely relate to what you said about this sort of external noise. Whenever I'm with other coaches or in their class or, or, or they're helping me or something, it is quite difficult to shut off that sense of kind of comparison and am I doing the right thing in front of them or are they doing the right thing in front of me? And it's because you're kind of on a different... Like if you're just a student in a new class or if you're just a kid, you're just like open eye you know you just you just try and embrace what's happening hopefully and just it's just like a little adventure it's like a little space where your mind is 
in a different space and your body is doing different things to normal. Um, but it, yeah, I, I can definitely relate. That's interesting about what you said with, uh, mm. with, with your mind reacting to, to different coaches and practices and, and things like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you think, uh, do you, do you think this actually links nicely with, with the Ruiz talk as well? Um, do you, how do you manage your mindset teaching people kind of singularly like on their own or maybe like online like you do with your, your videos um, and like in big groups how do you mm. how do you kind of adjust your headspace for those different challenges yeah so with like all my one-to-one -one clients I can obviously focus all my attention on them and give them real personal cueing or adjustments or I can kind of feel from their bodily reactions and their like facial expressions whether or not I need to change up the flow to make it more or less intense or you know whatever it is I can really try and like hone in on their needs um of course so it feels definitely more personal and you create more of an in-depth relationship with them where it goes beyond just student. I don't know if you have this like with like um, parkour coaching, but when I do one-to-ones, like we talk about uh, like everything because the practice of yoga encompasses the mind, the body, the soul. So I always ask like, right, how's your physical body doing? How's your mental body doing? How's your soul feeling? How's everything like getting on? Because we can't just, you know, discredit one and only look at the other. Um, so I try and um, ask all those kinds of questions and of course like things will come up that are quite deep, very personal for some people. So in that respect um, it's easier to have like a deeper connection to my students who are like one-to-ones and stuff and it's a very like intimate kind of setting as well. Mm. Um, you're perhaps moving through like vulnerable areas of like your body or whatever it is and you know, inevitably, because the practice is so intertwined with the um, the mind, the body and soul, and, you know, the whole idea that your body can hold on to stress and tension and traumatic memories, sometimes stuff like that comes up. Like, the amount of times I've cried in my practice, you know, that can happen in a one-to-one -one situation as well, mm -hmm. and I've had that before. So it's just making sure that space is cultivated and it's safe. Um, so then when it comes to me... So I already know, like, I guess going into that situation, I know I'm seeing this person today. I know I understand their history. I'm in the framework that I'm just there to help them, facilitate their movement, empower them, support them through this practice. When it comes to me guiding, like, bigger groups, um, it changes entirely because, obviously, if I wanted to focus on everyone the whole class would be like three hours long. <laughs> it's a little bit harder. So the cueing that I give is like more general, but then so it would be general to come into the pose, but say we're then in the pose for X amount of time. I'll be like, right, if you're feeling comfortable, if you want to take it further, here is an option. If you don't want to take it further, you want to come out of it a little bit more, here's another option. So I'm always trying to like give three different levels, say, of... Um, progress that you can take in a pose so I'm trying to like target each and every one so it's a lot they're both as mentally taxing as one another but for different kinds of reasons um yeah so I think that's it and of course like with you know my regular students that I do see in group settings we do have that relationship where I would say it's a little bit more like personal um I'd be like, yo, how's your day been? And they're like, no, nope, it was shit, work was shit. And it's that kind of deeper understanding or whatever it may be. But I think as well, because there's a sense that yoga is a safe space, people are more likely to be open when with how they're truly feeling, feeling a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Unfortunately, sometimes that can come across as like the teacher is now like therapizing the student, which is not what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, luckily, luckily I've got... got you know a uni degree in psychology so <laughs> I can understand like some elements of it but I'm also like I'm not like professionally equipped to give you like life advice with um 
I don't know, you know, whatever um, mental health you're kind of working through at the moment. As much as I would like to, I can't. So it's about having boundaries as well and establishing them. But yeah, there's a massive difference between one-on-ones and then group sessions. Mm. <laughs> and my last question before we go. Um, yes. I talked with Louise about, I asked him the question, how do we make concepts like stillness and um, harmony and kind of sp- spiritual terms like this? How do we how do we make them palatable for children? Um, because just quickly, something that I have experimented with in my own pipe or coaching is like just doing a one minute challenge at the end of a session and seeing who can lie on the floor and not make any noise or anything for one minute. They have to close their eyes. And I kind of frame it as like a challenge, see if they can do it. Um, And that's just like a tiny building block. Um, But kind of expanding this out more widely to maybe, you could say a very uh, secular UK, a very kind of um, no-nonsense kind of culture type thing. Um, How do you... How do you think we can try, or how do you think you can try and promote these ideas through yoga and make them accessible to people? And mm. yeah. Yeah, so again, like going back to where yoga was from and what it, who it was created for, it was again created for 14 year old boys. So this whole idea that yoga is there for everyone and it should be accessible for all and it doesn't just have to be the asana practice so the movement practice it could be you doing breath work that is still practicing yoga it could be you doing one of the kriyas like we said that is still part of it it could be you practicing non-attachment to certain things that's part of the practice as well so I guess what you could do is start to take more palatable components of what yoga is and trying to almost not not drip feed that sounds so so weird (laughs) but like kind of like you know planting those seeds in kids at a young age so one of the most simple ones ahimsa means compassion so we should all generally have compassion for one another how do you tell your kids that you know um there is uh in the yoga industry at least there are like specific yoga teacher trainings you can do for kids so you can teach kids so one of my friends ollie she teaches um like a kids class um before my class and they always have like games to play and a lot of the yoga poses are named after animals so it'd be like right we're coming into spider pose now and oh into downward dog so it's made more into a game almost like you said with um the whole lying down or even like a challenge um but even taking it to so I guess a lot of it could be like changing the language to make it more palatable for kids um but also introducing the idea, I think a lot of schools, particularly in like India, Nepal, have started influencing schools within like the Western world to bring in more like mindfulness classes into the curriculum. Not necessarily meditation, because I understand meditation can be quite um, a hard thing to get into and it's got its own like difficult connotations. Mm. But mindfulness, it's like bringing that awareness to the kids and a lot of schools have now started to bring in like yoga and everything. Um, and certainly over here in Brighton, we've got um, a foundation called Brighton Yoga Foundation and they're trying to bring yoga to loads of schools over here, which is incredible work. Um, and I think as well, when the kids are then exposed to it, it becomes another talking point and accessibility point for the parents so another example I have is in yoga we've got something called um Brahmahari breath or otherwise known as like bee breath and bee breath sounds really cool you know for kids as well they're like oh sweet bumblebee and it's actually a really beautiful practice you practice it exactly as you would as an adult but it can have so many benefits for kids especially kids who are like super super active hyperactive all the time as well doing this bee breath can really help like calm them down and it's a very nice like insular practice so yeah it's about like picking components off yoga and making it more digestible for kids in very accessible kinds of ways um i think slowly slowly yoga is going more into the mainstream um 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like parkour might be a little bit further behind. Like it's still not widely understood mm. by, by people. people. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of confusing faces I see, like, you know, walking around whenever there's people training outside. So I think parkour might be a little bit like further behind um, in that sense. But I don't know. Kids just seem to be so natural when they come to move and do parkour or just pick up any movement for that matter, really. <laughs> You know, it's about having a good coach with patience and also having kids willing to listen to you. I actually saw a really interesting post by this girl, a lady on uh, Instagram called Meg Squats. She's currently pregnant and she's just like gym owner. She's fucking strong, but also her whole ethos is really refreshing to see. And she trains this nine-year-old boy to do fucking Olympic lifting. This kid like deadlifted like, I don't know, like 50 kilos. I was like, that's fucking insane. But again, she was saying like, she gets a lot of backlash for teaching a kid. And she said, no, nope, the kid comes to me if they're patient and willing to learn and we take it step by step and they can start at any age as long as they're willing. <laughs> but that was really interesting. Damn, yes. 50K. Mm. <laughs> wow. <I don't> know. <laughs> that's crazy. I'll have to have, I'll have to have a look at that. That sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, big time. But anyway, we I know that you, time is moving on and you have <laughs> more classes to teach. So um, first of all, yeah, thank you so much. That was a real pleasure. Really, really interesting. Oh. Well, thank you for having me, Sam. It's like really nice that you reached out. I really appreciated it. <laughs> cool, cool. And I'd love to hear more of your thoughts another time on, on breathing and yoga. And it's something that I, I kind of... I did I did uh, one of your classes today just to kind of like see how you were... How you were how you coach them everything and um yeah I have a like a strange relationship with yoga and it's something that I kind of Mm -hmm. with these sort of talks I want to kind of delve into a bit more and just think more about kind of uh, especially like what I can do on these kind of very wet cold days and things and um yeah that sort of thing so yeah thank you that was that was great and um for everyone listening uh all the links um to Olive's work uh, videos, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. It'll all be in the description. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be down there. And if you're listening on Spotify, it'll be above you. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, guys, make sure you um, follow or subscribe. Um, that'd be great. I'm, I'm grinding. I'm trying to get four episodes a month at the moment, um, looking for lots of different coaches and interesting people. So... Um, Lastly, if you uh, want to hear the conversation I had with Louise, which we talked about a bit in this conversation, um, on Spotify you can just roll over, let this one play out, and then go and listen to that one. We did a podcast swap. I went on his, he went on mine, and it was great. It was super wholesome. (laughs) So, um, yeah, from me, thank you very much for listening, and thank you again, Olive. Thank you, Sam. See you later.